Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Abigail. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, my name is Ferenc Bodinski. I'm project manager for Ace Action Europe. Um, I would like to welcome everyone and thanks for joining on this um, uh, webinar on quality improvement in CAMSEX interventions. Um, just to quickly give, give you a, a who we are, we are calling in from Berlin and I have two colleagues also online with me who are responsible for communications. Um, we are a network of aid service organizations in the WHO Europe region and um, in our strategic framework, which is from 2018 to 2021, one of the core thematic areas that was identified by the steering committee is SRHR, sexual and reproductive health and rights. And within this broad topic, um, the steering committee decided to work on uh, two specific issues. One of them is uh, combination prevention and the other one is CAMSEX. And looking at these um, projects, uh, and especially our members um, uh, who are working on these issues, to provide them some capacity building, how to make their uh, work better and how they can make the uh, monitoring and evaluation of their programs, which is not only important for the users, but also for the organization and also for different applications to grants, etc. cetera. Um, so CAMSEX, why, why did we choose CAMSEX as an issue? Because it's a, it's a very complex issue that, has, uh, that includes legal issues, social issues, but also it is issues uh, around harm reduction and information for CAMSEX users, but also CAMSEX service providers. And um, <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen now, but I don't have the speakers, right? Just a minute. I mean, yes. And why we decided to, um, <clears throat> to work on quality improvement, is um, because in 2009, um, Aid Action Europe, together with the BZGA, which is the German uh, Ministry of Health Agency, and the WHO Europe, uh, started working on quality, improving quality in HIV prevention in Europe. Uh, there were some um, there were some um, tools developed, and this has worked into the. Quality Action Joint Action, which ran from 2013 to 2016, uh, with a lot of participants from all over Europe, and uh, and further tools were developed for the um, for quality improvement. Um, now, for some reason, I lost my uh, cursor. Okay. Anyway, um, so IQHIV moved. Uh, grew into a um, quality action on joint action. And we also thought that um, for the sustainability of programs, not just at the um, um, national level, but also at the European level, it is something that we can, uh, we can move back to. It's, uh, it's a tools that are free to use and can be um, um, an easy option for people who are interested in uh, applying the uh, quality improvement tools um, in their programs to use it. Um, this is for me a very short introduction and I would like to hand over to the floor to our two speakers. First, uh, Deirdre Siri from, from Ireland who has been involved with the quality action, um, joint action from the very beginning and also Matthias Wenzel Egerbert from Germany who has been uh, there from the very beginning, I think from 2009. So over to you, uh, Deirdre. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I had some technical issues first time around, so hopefully I'm sorted this time. This quality improvement uh, webinar is looking at chemsex. We're not the experts on chemsex, you are. We're the experts on quality improvement. So together we will merge what we do so that the outcome at the end of your application of the quality action tools is better HIV prevention work it, it, amongst chemsex users. 
What is quality improvement and why do we bother with it? Quality improvement helps us identify and implement strategies. It helps us evaluate those strategies to improve our projects and, and, pro and programs. So it's less about what we do day to day, it's more about putting the emphasis on understanding what we're doing and doing better, because better is always possible. Reflective practices can be challenging for people who work in organizations, especially community health workers who are very, very busy and often feel that to actually take time out of doing is just a waste of time. The quality improvement tools actually show that it's not a waste of time. They help you identify what's the problem that you want to share. What evidence is there for that problem? Is it just in your own head? Is it in data? And what is your vision? Basically, what we want to do is to show that by using the tools, we can make a, di a difference and we can do better. I'd like to draw your attention first off to the AIDS Act Action Europe Implementation Guide. It's really important to, to read this document before applying a tool, um, and particularly uh, starting off with planning and preparation. There's nine reasons to apply the tools. It's really important to get buy-in. People can often find it quite challenging to apply tools. So it's, it's a really good idea to actually get a, a support network around the tools application before you start. I'd also recommend key factors for, success, for successful quality improvement. That's also in the implementation guide. And then, it, Often we think we haven't got the resources, we haven't got money, we're not getting extra money to apply tools. From my experience, you don't really need extra money. You might do for teas and coffees if, 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 um, if that's necessary, but really uh, that the, you have a lot of resources. So I don't think resources can be an excuse for not, for not doing better. Also, are you ready for quality improvement? Don't try to save all the problems of the universe in your first tool application. It's really important to just attempt what, 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 what you can do at the beginning as a practice. Why quality improvement tools? The quality improvement tools are evidence-based and they're a structured approach. So they walk you through the process. They do it basically for you in terms of providing the structure. The fact that they're evidence-based makes a big difference when, you, when you're actually applying for funding for, for your work because you can say, we are using evidence-based tools. This matters more in some countries than in others. But certainly, if you can say that something is evidence-based, it makes a difference. It uses practical tools that guide you through the process. We, uh, we will look at, at some of those tools in this webinar. It recognizes and documents the problem. Often we assume that we know what the problem is, but we can all be going off and identifying different problems and not, not really having a shared understanding of what works well. It also identifies areas for improvement. This can sometimes be challenging for people, but we'll come, more, we'll come back to that again. What's really good is that it documents the achievements. There's been many times when I've known that we've done really good work in my organization where I used to work. And when you say it, it just doesn't really have the same ring to it as if you actually have an evidence-based document with, with the outcomes in it. That matters. Furthermore, it involves stakeholders. The quality improvement tools really invite uh, the uh, participation of, of people who have different experiences. Diversity is good, it's challenging, but it's also good. These are the quality action tools that are available on the Quality Action website. There's a brief description around each tool in the implementation guide and examples of how the tools can be used uh, for combination prevention and for chem six. As an example, the Succeed tool structure is as follows. 
it looks at goals. It talks you through how to how to write down your goals. Uh, asks you who your key populations are, what approach you're using. Is it harm reduction, etc. Um, who's responsible and what are they responsible for? Uh, how is the work organised and implemented? What resources do you have? And then looks at the process, the actual process of applying the tools. Then it looks at results. We all like results. These results will be written down. Planning a tool application, it's really, I can't emphasise highly enough the importance of creating a safe environment. It can be very challenging for people who are working away to have their work open to discussion by quite a diverse range of people, both uh, service users, key populations, managers, CEOs, sometimes funders, it depends on who you want to involve. And in my experience, it can be really, really affirming, but it can also be very challenging. And also, sometimes people feel judged by the process. They might feel they might get um, a bit defensive if they feel their work is either not understood or not appreciated. So constantly creating and recreating a safe environment in the application of the tool is really important. And to keep coming back to this idea that it's about valuing what is working well and what is not working well. So we're all in the business of trying to do better. Dealing with resistance is, it, 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 it's a, I think, it's an inevitable part of the process. People can get bored, they can feel that it's too structured, it's a waste of time. It's, a, it's about keeping buy-in to the process the whole, the whole way along, and that means checking with participants. Selecting the right participants is really important. You might not um, want to, or it might not even be possible to get everybody in the same room at the same time. Um, it's a question of actually select, selecting the participants and then working out how they can be involved and what, what levels. We'll come back to that. It's really important as well that you familiarize yourself with the tools. There's a tool selection guide referenced in, in the implementation guide. Uh, of the five tools, you might find that you want to use some of Succeed and some of uh, PQD or bits of other tools just to, to, to do bits of research. It's really important that you're familiar with the tool and that you're not actually looking through the tool and when somebody asks you a question about it, you don't know uh, any more than they do. So being familiar with the tools is very important. So once you start applying the tool, actually looking at the goal. What is your, the goal? And a goal is a shared understanding and a solid understanding about what you want to address. This is absolutely essential. So you might have a goal in your head that you want to reduce HIV amongst chemsex users. I would suggest that's a very big goal. So it's a question of actually choosing a clear and concise goal that is applicable to your particular work and the work of your project and your organization. Um, what do you want to achieve and why? So it might be similar to other people working in chemsex uh, work around Europe, or it might be different. The main thing is that you choose something that's clear, concise, and smart. I suppose everybody is familiar with, the, with smart, that's specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-framed. The other um, advantage of this is, let me ask a question here. Um, advantage Oops. my machine is moving around of its own accord um, it helps everybody to understand the, the work to develop a shared understanding from my experience this is not always the case um, people people can be working side by side and have totally different understandings and um, motivations for working so when you have to write down the words on, in a tool application, it really does lead to a very interesting discussion around what you're doing and getting a shared understanding. This is really important for harmony as, as well as everything else. What are your key populations? 
A good project knows a lot about the people it serves, including who they are and why they want and or need what the project provides. You, in your prevention work and as a community health worker, may have a sense of what uh, people involved in chemsex need. They might not share that view. So how do you negotiate those kind of things? Who do you talk to, to, to understand, to fully understand what people want or need and what your, what your funders want or need and what your CEO wants or needs? What key, po what key populations are you trying to reach and why? Are you trying to reach all chemsex users? Are you trying to, to, to reach those who are, who are a bit more visible? Um, and why do you want to reach them? You know, it might seem obvious to you, but if you actually talk to other people in applying a tool, you might all have different reasons as to why you want to reach them. Some might have moralistic reasons, some might have uh, harm reduction reasons. You know, it's really important to, to, to firm up exactly why you want them. Um, um, why do they want it? That we, we've talked about that. So who is going to be involved? Sometimes um, if people are, you have direct access to them and sometimes you don't. Particularly with chemsex users, they may or may not want to be involved in your initiative. You may, you may find that you have to work through intermediaries. You know your population better than everybody else, so it's a question of actually you identifying the best people to, to have involved in your participation uh, project, in your, in your quality improvement project, so that you know you're actually reaching the people most at risk. Did you use any data or other information to your make, make, select, make your selection? You know, what is the evidence that what you're doing is working? Um, the AIDS Action Europe website has uh, many organisations involved who are really doing very good work that you can learn from. The website has lots of information uh, around the work that's going on and what works. And also STCOM, uh, which was another European funded initiative uh, coordinated, that, that part of it was coordinated by Deutsche AIDS Hilfe. And they also have evidence around um, needs around Europe. So there's lots of information out there if, 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 if we take the time to actually seek it. Participation, participatory quality development. This is one of the toolkits that's part of quality improvement. One example of it is it has a chart with nine levels of participation. Not everybody who's going to be in, uh, uh, participate in the application of your tool will have the same level of responsibility or interest or time or power. So it's a question of actually looking through the chart and seeing who can have uh, what, what level of participation when. And another really fun example to use with, with your team is circles of influence where you can actually chart who, who can be involved and, and at what level. These, I, I think these two are not only very popular uh, mechanisms to use in a workshop, but they're also um, very effective so you get a clear understanding. For example, you might think that you have total uh, say over your project, but your CEO or your manager might have, uh, might have different ideas. Um, the implementation guide has workshop examples of how you can put these two uh, PQD aspects of their tool in, into practice. Another aspect to look at when you're, when you're uh, organizing your tool application is facilitation. Are you using somebody internally or externally? Is it going to be facilitated by the manager, the CEO, or somebody else in the organization? Um, which you know has its advantages, but then people might feel that they're being judged or that they're being honest about something, and that you know it's it stays within the organisation. Or do you get somebody who's external, who may be familiar with facilitation but less uh, familiar with the work? It's important to just decide who's the best person to to facilitate the process. If it's an external facilitation, it takes a bit more time to get them up to speed with the, with the kind of ethos and the work of the organization. And who owns the process or the program? It, 
is it the community health workers or is it the, 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 the management of the organization or is it the funders? It's just important to think about this uh, to avoid confusion when you're halfway through the process and then you realize that actually you're all talking about maybe different ownership of the project, of the tool application. Um, communicate, communication mechanisms between people is really important as well. If somebody is involved as an intermediary, for example, with, with, with chem sex workers, um, but not necessarily come to the meetings. How do you keep those people in the loop? How do you get their, their, their constant feedback? So it's important to think about the communication mechanisms and agree that with them so that people are not left uh, hanging around waiting for you to get back to them so, you know, sometime when, when you have the time. Issues particular to chemsex. Um, accessing PrEP. PrEP may or may not be available in, in, in your country. Um, you can actually get information from AIDS Action Europe, I'm sure, around organizations where it is available and where it's free. In some countries, it might be available, but not free. Um, I think uh, accessing PrEP is obviously you know, one, one of the issues that we could actually apply a quality imp improvement to, to. And then there's the issues of rights and needs and motivation. You know, why are we doing this? Is it to, uh, to improve? Uh, the HIV prevention work? Is it to improve our understanding of, of chemsex and, and why people are involved with chemsex? Um, is it to have a harm reduction approach? You know, like exactly why are we doing it? And what that, that will help us to firm up on our goals and, uh, and then help with our evaluation. Um, I've talked already about access to chemsex users. I think access can be uh, a reason for doing nothing. <laughs> we can say, oh, people are really difficult to access, um, so therefore we only go for the, the, the what's called the low-hanging fruit, the people who are easy to access, and then we say we know what we're doing. It's really important to really stretch ourselves, and I think participants opening uh, the participatory process to a wider group of people can really challenge our, 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 our ideas. Um, participation in strategies, there's different perspectives. Often when, when we're um, a, a applying tools, there's a moment co that comes when someone says something that you hadn't thought about. And I think that's like one of those light bulb moments that can actually open doors and let your future work be inspired by that. And I think it is a question about being brave and open to participation, even from people that we don't like or who might be competitive with us. And then it's a question of how we measure outcomes versus outputs. This can be a bit of a technical problem, but our question, it's not a question of actually doing, doing, doing. It's about, are we doing something that is making a difference? You know, are our outcomes what we want? It's not a question of whether we're reaching 10 or 50 people. It's, it's really about the quality of the work. And that's what uh, the quality improvement tools are about. They're about the quality of, uh, of the work and the quality of our prevention initiatives. Documentation. Often busy people are less likely to document than, say, academics in the university. I can remember years ago reading uh, a, a, a write-up of a peer education program that I knew wouldn't work, but it was done by academics who didn't work in the field, and they, they showed that it did work, but it didn't, they didn't really. And I was very frustrated, and then I had to be honest and say to myself, well, actually, I'm not documenting. How is, how is anybody supposed to know? And I think it can be useful for funding applications at its basic level, but documenting local knowledge and evidence is really, really important. Um, you know, when, when, when we talk to each other at workshops, we know such a lot. But if we don't document it, then it can be dismissed as anecdotes. So the, the, applying the tools helps us to really put in place practice-based evidence and to build practice-based evidence. So when you go to your European meetings with other people involved in, in, in chemsex, you have your practice-based evidence. It's not you just kind of making things up or whatever comes into your head. You, you, it's, it's, actual, it's actually a different type of evidence. What is working well 
and what and the areas for improvement. The tools, because they have a yes or no format and they uh, they they get you to write down the areas for improvement. They're documented. They also document what actions you need to take, why you're taking them, what you're doing, how you're doing it, who is taking it, who's doing what, uh, who's doing what with whom, and when you're doing it. So by by applying these tools, it really helps you to focus very easily on having a structured approach. So that's my section on um, just introducing the process of quality improvement. This section is uh, th this webinar is not actually around uh, giving you the kind of blueprint for how to do better work in, in, in the chem sex field. It's about providing a tool or a, an overview of the tools that can help with your quality improvement. So I hope you've got some questions. Thank you, Deidre. And yes, the floor is open for questions of clarification or anything that, that uh, you would like to uh, ask from, from Deidre based on her presentation. Looks like that everything was very clear. So maybe um, I've got a question, Deidre. I just wanted to ask yeah. you. Um, it's Matthias here. I'm the other presenter. Um, you you said that you you mentioned briefly that you had some experience in actually applying these tools to projects that you were involved with in in an organisation. Can you can you maybe say a little bit more about your experience of actually applying one of the quality improvement tools, like what the main challenge challenge was, and what the main benefit was for for your team. I suppose the main challenge at the beginning is resistance. Um, people saying that they didn't have enough time. Also, just because it is so structured, people tended to get a bit irritated. It was almost like following a rule book, but it isn't a rule book. And um, so I, I think people got a bit impatient sometimes with, with the process. And then at other times, people got very defensive uh, because they felt that their work was being talked about and, and nobody else's uh, work was, was being talked about. Another challenge, of course, is, is who you involve around key populations. And, you know, not everybody likes each other. Not everybody um, trusts each other. So it's a question of, uh, getting mechanisms where you can have key populations involved at whatever level is, is, is appropriate for them. Um, the out, at the end of the process, I was actually amazed at how people felt so much better. And so the first time uh, of applying the tool, you, you meet the most resistance. And then after that, it's, it's not so daunting and it's not so threatening. And actually, I think people really see the value of it once they once they actually have the results and the, uh, and, and the experience. And it really does uh, improve the work and improve the understanding of the work of, of, of people who are working together. Are there any other questions or shall we move on to uh, Matthias and listen to his presentation? I don't see any questions in the chat window, so yes, Matthias, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm just waiting to share my screen. Yeah. Just have to be given my... Ah, now I'm able to share my screen. So here, I hope you can see it now. So my presentation follows on from what Deirdre has introduced you to. So um, one of the aspects that quality improvement tools can contribute to is looking at how you know whether you are actually making a difference. And I think this applies to many, many fields of, of sexual and reproductive health, but especially interventions that are less medical, less structured, more behavioral, more social, more cultural. And I think those things would all apply to 
interventions around chemsex in particular. And this question, how do you know you're making a difference, I think is, sim is something that as community health workers, we ask ourselves quietly um, because it's sometimes difficult to detect whether we are making a difference and whether we're doing the right thing. And sometimes it takes a long time before we can notice that what we've been doing all this time has actually made a big difference. So quality improvement tools can help with documenting the evidence of um, how we make a difference. And different tools do this in, in different ways. So let's, let's have a look. Um, I'm going to be giving you examples from two of the five tools that are available on the Quality Action website. And there are many more quality improvement tools in the world. The Quality Action Project used five of them. And I'm going to give you examples of two. One of them is called Succeed. And this is a questionnaire-based quality improvement tool that goes through the chapters that Deirdre has already mentioned. You don't need to remember that now. We are looking at the last chapter of, of the Succeed tool, which is called Results of the Project. And as an introduction, it talks about measuring effects. And it says here that it's important to know if your project is making a difference. And I think that's, that's familiar to all of us. And it's sometimes difficult to measure the results. But what we should be able to do, even if we can't provide the kind of evidence that a researcher would be happy with, we need to know whether we are moving in the right direction. And there are, there is, there are always ways of determining whether we are moving in the right direction, even if it's difficult to measure things accurately. And this is true for both the key populations. So are we making a difference to the key populations? And also, what are we? What difference are we making with in possible intermediaries? So people that we are working with who are then reaching the key population. And the side effect of looking at results of a project with using a quality improvement tool is that you also identify if there are any unintended or undesirable effects from your work because you're looking at all of the effects that your work might have. So this next slide is just a. Uh, um, uh, an excerpt from the Succeed tool in its printed form or in its PDF form. It's, it's basically full pages with lots of space for your answers. I've um, reduced this down to fit on the slide, but the questions are all yes or no questions. And the simple, um, I guess the, the, the method that Succeed uses is that if you answer your quest a question with yes, then that means that you are on the right way to having a high quality project. If you answer a question with no, then this is an area that you should look at to improve. And so it's a fairly simple thing. Once you've worked through a chapter, you can look at how many yeses and how many noes did we have and which of the noes can we address and how can we do better in those areas. So this sample question just talks about, does the project measure whether their um, knowledge attitudes or behavior for the um, key populations or intermediate target groups have changed over time. So this is a general kind of introductory question to the whole area of evaluation. And if you answer yes, then it's also important to discuss with the participants in your quality improvement application, um, how do you then measure these changes? And if you don't measure them, then maybe you should look at ways of measuring them. And then it asks a further question going into more detail. Are those changes in line with the project goals? And that shows you whether what you're actually doing has a good relationship to the goals. And yet we talked about how important clear goals are. And if your um, the changes that you're detecting are not in line with the goals, that could have there could be several reasons. One reason could be that you're not doing what you're intending to do. But the other reason could be that your goals are not up to date anymore. And um, so the discussion of quality improvement, or the, so you can see that these tools just bring up topics for discussion that can then lead to making decisions to improve either the goals or to improve the way you do the work or to improve the way you measure what you're doing. And in the end, the quality of the project overall will increase. But you can't predict before you apply the tool what improvements you might make. So the, what, what the tools do is they bring up the right kinds of questions and they get you as a group 
to have the kinds of discussions that will lead to new ideas and improvements. So they're not going to give you the answers, but they are asking the right questions so you will come up with improvements and answers. And um, when we had the Quality Action Project, we asked people who had applied tools to write some case studies. And there are a, a, there's a big selection of case studies from different projects with, on all sorts of different topics on the website that you can read up on. And you will see that one of the most common, um, the most common um, feedback is that we some ideas come up that we had no that we didn't expect we didn't anticipate some of the ideas that came up for improvement and i think that's that's the paradox of quality improvement tools they are very structured so they look very narrow but their main their main task is to get you to have the right conversations that will bring up unexpected outcomes unexpected improvements that you didn't think of before and that's, I think that's the beauty of using a structured tool. Anyway, so here's some, just some more examples of what these questions look like. Um, it also often asks, it, once you've answered yes or no, it asks why, and this is often where the new ideas will come. Sometimes it's also okay to say, well, we don't measure these changes because we don't have the capacity, and at the moment we are in an emergency situation, we have to respond and we, we don't have the capacity to do it. That's probably that might be an okay thing to to do. That what the tool does is it makes you make it explicit and document it so that you know why, for what reason you are doing certain things and for what reason you are not doing other things, which can be really helpful when you have to apply for projects or report on projects or defend your way of working with your funders or anything like that. So did we already? talked about documentation. So the tools are actually automatically giving you an opportunity to, to document what you do and why you do it. At the end of each short set of questions, and there are always usually two or three or four questions, and then there is this improvements and next steps section in the succeed tool, which always has the same three elements. It then asks, what actions do you need to take to improve? And this is what, that's where you document the ideas that came out of your discussion. But then you're also prompted immediately to make like an action plan to decide who will take responsibility for that improvement and when that improvement will be, will be um, put in place. And it's important to also take an opportunity there to, to think about um, some improvements might make sense to do immediately because they're easy to do. and the time is right. Some improvements you might have really good ideas, but it might not be the right time to, to put them into practice yet. But if you document them at least and you have an action plan that you can go back to, you can then you can then revisit and put them into um, action at a, at a later time. So, so succeed would be one option of doing quality improvement. So it's a very structured questionnaire that you work through with a group of people that you decide on um, and also you decide on on the facilitation and Deirdre has already mentioned that and how important it is to decide who will participate. This this next example is PQD, so um, participatory quality development. That's a different kind of quality improvement tool that is not a questionnaire. It's actually a, a, a toolkit. It's a, it's a um, a selection of methods that you can choose to improve the, the different aspects of your project so that you can apply them to the planning, you can apply them to implementation, you can apply them to evaluation. And the PQD tool consists of a theory part and then some um, practical advice on how to use it. And there's, for example, there's a table of which, which of the methods fits which purpose. Um, and so you can you can then choose from the toolkit which ones you you want to use, um, and it also introduces some background theory on evaluation, for example. So when we're when we're talking about knowing, getting an idea of what difference we make, that's part of the evaluation of a project. And then in the PQD tool prompts you with some questions: which intervention is to be evaluated? So which part of the project? So you could your chemsex intervention might actually you want to, might want to evaluate as a whole, or you might want to evaluate one particular aspect of it. 
and that goes back to what Deirdre also said is it, it's important to start small um, with quality improvement so people have a, a good experience and have some results reasonably soon so they can see the benefits and if it works well and they do they can see that it was beneficial then you might um, evaluate or use quality improvement on a larger component of your project so you, you might only use it on outreach or you might only use it on your website presence or on your brochures or on uh, yeah, any any particular part and then you ask the question who should be involved um, to do quality improvement on this particular part of your of your work it's also really important to know why you are evaluating something and what you're hoping to gain from the evaluation and that also leads sometimes to the third question for whom is the evaluation carried out so is it is it for your own benefit because you want to know um, how well you're doing or is it because someone ordered you or that you know you are obliged in some way to do an evaluation and for different audiences you might different you might do different um, types of evaluation so then it goes on to give you some um, of the main steps of doing quality improvement in the evaluation part of your project. Mainly it's about data, about the questions um, that you're asking of your objectives. Oh, the, the question is, you know, how are we uh, achieving our objectives? The next is data collection. Some decisions have to be made about how to collect the data in data cleaning and analysis and then importantly also reporting back and drawing conclusions regarding the improvements that you want to make and this, these are fairly standard um, items on uh, an evaluation work plan you might be familiar with it but here we're now looking at what kinds of quality improvement methods can we use to improve our evaluation processes so now I want to just give you a brief example of one of the methods that the participatory quality development toolkit offers you to do evaluation um, and one of them is called rapid assessment and you might be familiar with it it's a it's a it's a quick survey tool and what's nice about the PQD um, quality improvement tool is that it gives you step-by-step -step instructions of how to apply this method so even if you've never done a rapid assessment before to get some data about whether you're doing well or not, you can use these instructions and basically start with no, prep with no further preparation. It gives you every step that you need to take from the preparation to the um, conducting the survey and to analyzing the data. And it, can, and it does this in a three page short, um, in a, yeah, short document, which I will just um, show you briefly so you know what you can expect from it. So this is this is what one of these instruction sheets looks like. So you can see this one is on rapid assessment. Then it gives a brief description, talks about prerequisites, gives an overview of the process. It also importantly tells you what resources you need to do it, whether there's any costs involved, and then it gives you detailed working steps and you could just work through them with your team step by step they're very short and then some additional tips at the end and notes so this is three pages to do that has basically everything in it that you need to do a rapid assessment which might be one of the methods you use to figure out whether you are moving in the right direction to give you some data some simple data So just to conclude, some of the things we talked about is that applying a quality improvement tool, it doesn't tell you how to do your work, but it generates ideas about how to do it better. And importantly, what you get out of using a quality improvement tool depends also very much on who you invite to the quality improvement process. And that means thinking not only about your team, but also maybe about key informants or key people from your key population 
who have particular expertise or you can provide a perspective that you don't have in your team. You might also involve someone who is a drugs expert or a, an expert on a particular area of, of um, knowledge that, that you might need. Um, so it, it's important to think clearly about who you want to invite. And the, the third thing to really remember is that these tools look really look really structured and they can look a little bit daunting because there are lots of words on paper. But doing quality improvement is all about interaction. The tools are there to structure that interaction. So you don't have to think about, oh, have we covered this? Oh, have we covered, oh, we should really also think about that. The tools have been prepared and constructed to cover all the important aspects of projects. So you can just, that's why it's important to choose the tool that you think will work for you and familiarize yourself with it, but then you can just rely on the tool to guide you through the process and concentrate on the interesting ideas and the interesting conversations that the tools generate. And lastly, Applying quality improvement also makes you explain to yourself and to others what you are doing. And you can also, and it also helps you explain what you're doing to someone who has a different viewpoint. So after applying a quality improvement tool, you will have a lot more words and arguments and explanations that you can use with your funders, with other stakeholders, um, also to share internationally and um, and with related projects who you might want to um, also pull in as allies to support you in your work. And lastly, I want to show you uh, a kind of representation in a, in a little model of what quality improvement is or how the quality action group at least understood it, understands it. And in this diagram you can see quality is starts small and is always increasing and increases hopefully forever. This is representing our projects and they consist of this cycle that has it's been in the in the literature for a long time with different names. So the plan do check act cycle so a project always starts somewhere and then keeps revolving around. So we want to roll this project up the quality hill. And what drives us, what drives quality improvement is participation and self-reflection. Those are the two main ingredients that you need to, for quality improvement to have a good chance. Participation because you need the different perspectives of different people. And self-reflection, you need to be able to step back from the work and be able to look at it a little bit more cold-blooded than usual. So to, to put your, your own um, passion aside a little bit and this is what will will move it up the quality scale and then there's this little wedge in here and that's standard so one of the effects of quality improvement is that you will probably discover that there are some key things that need to be in place for a project to work well and they are often not documented but when we document them they can become standards and that means that you can preserve them so if the staff changes, if the project is not funded for one year, but then maybe it's funded again, you know you have some standards, you have documented some of the basic quality aspects of your project, and that will prevent the, the quality of the project to roll from rolling back down the hill if there is any disruption that can come from different sources. And standards can also be used for something that's a little more, bit more simpler process is a quality assurance process where you just make sure that you tick you know, the main boxes of the standards. Okay, that's the end of my presentation. And again, we have an opportunity for comments and questions. Stop sharing. Thank you, Matthias. There is actually a question in the um, chat window right. coming from S. Barros. What is the estimated cost of employing the presented tools? There, there, there is no cost to, the, to using the tools. The tools are freely available on the internet, on the Quality Action website. The costs that you may uh, need to cover depend 
a little bit on how many people you invite and whether you do quality improvement as part of your normal team meetings or whether you have a separate event. We have some experience with people who have used like a team development day to do quality improvement. So they were they went away from the workplace and they hired a different room and they had some refreshment. So there was some cost involved in that. Um, another cost that is possible is if you choose to have an external facilitator that might involve a cost. Um, but to do quality improvement itself is doesn't doesn't involve a cost. From my experience, um, we can often use n not having extra money as a, as a barrier. And um, really, we didn't need any extra money to, to apply the tools. Even getting an external facilitator, it might be possible to get an external facilitator from a similar uh, organization who might be involved in maybe harm reduction with drugs or something. Um, so that they're related, but not necessarily in your organization if you want an external one. The, the implementation guide has a whole list of resources that are required, but really um, there's, there's no need to uh, have extra funding for it. You might decide to choose a, a very big goal as a second step or a third step, uh, in which case doing the quality improvement, applying quality improvement tool at an early stage can include as one of your goals to apply for funding for a bigger piece of work. But really, you know, to, to apply a tool shouldn't, doesn't necessarily require any extra money. And I'd reiterate again that it's good to start small and maybe start with only a, a chapter from one of the tools in a team meeting so you get a feel for what quality improvement feels like and what the benefits are. Okay, here's some, there's some more questions here. The next question is, please give an example of good results of Chemsex intervention. I would have to give that question back to the other participants. Um, if you have documented Chemsex interventions that, um, that, have, that have results that you'd like to share, I think Kirsten at least would be really interested, but maybe others would be interested as well. So if, if any of you have something, then please please say it in the chat or using your microphone now. Then there's another um, question here from someone. I can't see the first name. Anyway, documenting the process is very important. If you want to have some evaluation, you have to have data. So is there any suggestion regarding documenting process in order to have evidence at the end? Usually we need impact and outcome indicators to measure the changes. But here we have programmatic data. So what do you recommend? On which data we should pay attention to success, to document them? I think there's a difference between the data that you have to collect for your funding body or you know that you're obliged to collect and some of the data that you can also collect that will tell you whether you are moving in the right direction and those can be the same but they can complement each other what what pro, what quality improvement can do in addition to the data that you're already collecting is it will document what Deirdre called um, um, practice based evidence so evidence that is not necessarily based on outcomes or numbers or you know test results or anything like that but it's based on the the collective experience of your team and if when that's documented it can become a really good guide of um, for for process for process evaluation it can add it can add data for process evaluation and that and some of the tools in the in the PQD toolkit can actually help you collect any type of data because but there are there are good instruments there if you have trouble collecting data on any of the indicators that you want you can use some of those tools to collect them I, I think as well about documenting data it's easy to take for granted the knowledge that we gain from working in the field 
and we have to realise that funders don't have that knowledge. The medical profession who are not working in, in the same areas as we do don't have that information. Um, other organisations might not have that information. So it makes a big difference to actually document it. And to, uh, in terms of whether your outputs versus your outcomes, if you're trying to measure outcomes, then you really have to stick close to your goals, with, which will have measurable outcomes, and, uh, and, and then docu do the work that actually shows that, that your work has achieved the outcome, or if it hasn't achieved the outcome, why it hasn't, because often that information can be as interesting as, as if you have achieved your outcome, because sometimes it shows you that the, the, uh, the, the key populations you're working with, the needs are far more complex than you thought. That's all evidence. As far as, as as far as quality improvement is concerned, and there was a question from from Ben, or you wanted to say something, Ben? You also typed into the chat. Is it something different? Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Uh, hi, I just wanted. Uh, my name is Ben Collins. I'm with the European Chemsex Forum, and I wanted to respond to Castutis's question. Uh, about what kind of uh, sec uh, successful responses there are. Um, we have the, the European Chemsex Forum groups.io, and I put how to join there. Uh, it's fair to ask that question of uh, the people on that groups.io. There are over 540 people across uh, WHO Europe who are on that group. Uh, plus, uh, there are, if you look back through the chat, you will see people presenting uh, information on the work they've done. And then if you look in the data section, you can see information provided. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to give you my, uh, I'll, I'll put my uh, email right here. That's all I have to say for right now. Thank you, Ben. And scrolling up a bit, there was a question from Andreas Vitali from Ukraine, Kiev Public Health Center, Ministry of Healthcare of Ukraine. Can you tell some information about self-chem prophylactic box? Was it successful in Germany? Um, I think you referred to the, uh, the ChemSex box, which is about uh, different uh, prevention tools in them. I don't have uh, information about its success. Uh, unless someone from Germany can, can tell whether it was successful, who has information on it? Or if, Ben, you have heard something about it via the ChemSex forum list? Uh, I've actually not. I've heard, I mean, there are a number of examples of people sh shared on the ChemSex list. Um, to be honest, I don't think usually people oppose one option versus another. Um, uh, I know that uh, chemsex users are strongly encouraged. Uh, chemsex, uh, HIV negative chemsex users are strongly encouraged to consider PrEP as one tool. And um, I know there are various tools in Amsterdam, uh, Germany, um, uh, the UK and also some tools that have been demonstrated on the group side aisle from Israel. But I don't know particularly about the German. Can I just um, say that we're, we're not experts in chemsex, uh, as I said earlier on, but the advantage of actually working at European level and particularly the advantages of attending the workshops that AIDS Action Europe are going to organize um, around quality improvement is that there will be people who are working on chemsex there and it's an opportunity to share the expertise and the issues and the problems and the achievements that people there and that's where that that's that that that's one of the real uh, beauties of, of working across Europe is that it really challenges your ideas of what you can achieve, what you can achieve, and uh, open your eyes to what what is happening in other parts of Europe, whilst also affirming what you're doing yourself. So the tools and the discussion and application of the tools provides a structure where those discussions can take place, and the expertise 
around the chemsex comes from the, the people who are working in the European Chemsex Forum and in countries around Europe who are actually coming with their own issues to the table. So it's a beautiful marriage, if you like that idea, the, the application of the tools and the expertise which is in, in the room and in, and in the forum that, that is actually applied to the tools. Thank you, Deidre. And there was another uh, question which uh, from Amr Goar, which says that I missed the part which was showing chemsex dangers versus introducing PrEP to chemsex users. Um, I'm not sure with what this refers to. Amr, could you uh, clarify your question or comment? We say you mean priority-wise. Uh, as as, as Deidre said, in, during the presentation, we were not discussing chemsex itself and what kind of interventions should be there for uh, chemsex users. I think it depends on the individual, but it can also uh, depend on the local settings. For instance, if PrEP is available or not. Um, we, we were more talking about the uh, the quality action tools applications. But I think this is a this is one of the great questions that yep. uh, during a, a quality improvement um, tool application, you would have a really good chance of getting to the bottom of this question for your area and to find a good answer or a good approach forward, because this is exactly somewhere where you might want to improve. You're not quite sure how to prioritize these two um, responses, and having having a a structured quality improvement discussion with some other um, team members and experts in the room, you have a good chance of, of um, finding a good answer for that. That will actually fit you because I'm sure that in on the forum there will, there will be plenty of examples of people who said, oh, we do this or we do the other one. But to find the one that will, will work in your area, a local discussion um, and self-reflection process and quality improvement could be one of those processes when is likely to give you good ideas. Thank you, Matthias. Are there any other questions? If not, then uh, I would like to thank our speakers. And um, I would also like to give you, as, as Deidre has already mentioned uh, this workshop, I would like to give you some information about the future activities that we are planning to do uh, here in AIDS Action Europe on quality improvement in CAMSEX uh, interventions. After these uh, webinars, and, and just to make sure that the webinars are recorded so it is going to be made available for, uh, for everyone. So it's not only who could participate, but others who didn't have a chance to uh, be here with us today. Um, and we will also distribute the presentations and also the other documents that, that, we, that we mentioned, uh, such as the application guide. Uh, and we are planning to have a call right after the webinar, so it should come out latest early next week. And that's call, that call is for a small workshop, participation in workshop. If you remember in the... Um, in the registration questionnaire, we ask you about uh, whether you have a quality improvement tool in place, whether you have CAMSEX uh, projects going on or programs going on, and whether you would be interested in uh, further collaboration. So this is the collaboration we can offer. Uh, there, is, um, there will be an application form for uh, five um, organizations who are eight section of members will be selected to participate in a workshop run by Deidre and, and Matthias and together with five other organizations who are working on combination prevention and they would like to apply the, the quality improvement tools into their combination prevention work. So there will be a workshop on, on discussing more into details how to, uh, how to apply these, um, these tools in their um, programs and projects. And afterwards, we are going to um, give a small grant for these, uh, for these organizations who are selected. This grant could be enough for uh, 
as, as they reset coffee and tea and some some cakes for the participants of the um, of the group that you want to work with the group, or maybe it will cover some of the hours that you are writing the the report. And uh, once this tool once this tool is applied in uh, July, August, September, we are planning to have an evaluation meeting on it uh, at the end of the year. Are there any other questions? If not, then uh, we would like to close down the webinar. And thanks again for the participation, also for the valuable comments and questions. In the chat window, you can still read some of the um, important uh, links and also Ben's email, etc. cetera. Um, thank you, and, and please look out for our communication regarding the call for workshops. Yes, and thank you. Thank you, Abigail and Blanca, for hosting it and supporting us on having this webinar. And I will, I will write you an email for all the information we disseminated here and the recordings. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.